Hello and welcome to the Southbound Sports Show. I'm your host, Richie Leahy, here with my co-host, Maddie B. Now, our plan was to start going through some of the NFL draft stuff, but we had some other big-time quarterback moves. But before we get into that, we're going to hit on the, uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers right off the top. Uh, the NFL Network came out and they announced that the Pittsburgh Steelers will have the toughest schedule in 2021, which we knew was going to happen. Whenever you start off undefeated, and I know they didn't end with the best record, but you're going to be there. Plus, the NFL likes to match up divisions. So they're going to play. They already play in the toughest division. So they're going to get the toughest crossover games. Uh, they're doing this based on record. It's a 2020 record. So it might not end up being that way. But last year, their combined opponent record would be 155 wins, 115 losses, and two ties. Which is unbelievable that their schedule would even have two ties on it. But that's going to be their record for uh, 2021. And so out of the, remember, there's 17 games now. So out of those 17 games, 10 games uh, are against opponents that made the playoffs. And again, some of that is based on their division because they're in such a tough division with both the Ravens and the Browns making the playoffs last year. It's going to kind of skew the numbers. But I wanted to get your thoughts on that going into the season. How does that make you feel? Well, I kind of figured that it was going to come that way because the last couple of years they've had a relatively easy schedule by default. So I think they were due to have that catch up to them. I think you saw with the earlier part of last year, they, they mowed down with what was speculated as the cupcakes and they were undefeated. And then later in the year, they started playing some of the better teams and more playoff caliber teams and were losing games. I mean, it, it definitely falls in line with, with what we saw happen. Sometimes, though, I feel like that's the narrative, but sometimes they like to still lose the head-scratching game like to the Raiders two years ago, which made them miss the playoffs. And then you have like the Bengals this past year, which they had no business losing. I know I had talked about them losing to the Redskins. They had a losing record. They ended up making the playoffs. But still, if you're trying to push for a, a buy in the playoffs or you're trying to push for that top spot, you can't be losing to these teams late in the season. And I honestly think that it's just a product of, I've been trying to think about it, and I wonder if it's just age, because they also have a lot of unnecessary injuries, and I'm starting to wonder sometimes if it's how they practice, or maybe possibly some of the, the training that they do. Because you see it a lot with programs, and I think that... Uh, like just looking at college, like with Harbaugh at Michigan, I think they have the same issue where he does a lot of like hard hitting practices. And from the outside, it's head scratchy because it's like, why are you doing all that late in the season? You should be resting your guys and getting them healed up. And so then you have a ton of guys that it seems like you're constantly banged up every year and you have a worse record in November on. And so sometimes I wonder with the Steelers, like lately, is it because Ben is so old that they're falling off and it falls squarely on him? Or is it something else with the team because you had so many injuries, and I know some of the injuries are going to be freak injuries. All the teams suffer through them. But some teams more than others, it seems like, always hit that injury bug. And so I wonder if it is part of like the coaching style that they have. They're known to be a physical team. Are they being that physical in practice late in the season? which consistently wears your team down. I don't know. I mean, as a coach, do you make adjustments later on in the year? Or how do you Absolutely. handle that? Absolutely, you have to. Because if you're dealing with a bunch of injuries, you can't do as much contact to practice because if you get more people injured and you're already thin at certain positions, then all you're doing is you're setting yourself up for failure. Um. I know there's there's some people that have that attitude and that mindset, and maybe it's different in the NFL, where you can say, you know, come Tuesday or Wednesday, we're going to be live and we're going to we're going to be more aggressive. But I, I think more more and more the games evolving to the mental aspect, and it's not so much 
the hitting through the week. It's, are you aligning right? Or do you understand the calls? Do you understand the game plan? And, and doing more stuff from the perspective of like the mental aspect as opposed to the physical. I mean, I've just been trying to think through some of the changes because you see coaches that are always like talking about the strength and conditioning coach and how that makes a huge impact. I mean, Urban Meyer got in hot water trying to bring in the coach from Iowa. They never really seemed to have that problem. Uh, they went hardcore in the off season, pushing people to where they're getting hospitalized. So maybe it's just be having your body get ready for those tough conditions. And then in the late season, maybe you don't wear down that. I don't know. I mean, each team's going to have to approach it differently, but I was just thinking about it the other day because I, I was wondering when was the last time you had a pure hard hitting team win the Super Bowl? Or consistently make a run in the playoffs because even like the Steelers and the Ravens, they haven't been doing it. I mean, that Ravens team won the Super Bowl, what, 2013? The Steelers, maybe like five years before that, four years before that, they won one. Uh, other than that, the teams that have been making the playoffs are more finesse teams, like ball control teams, just doing whatever. Uh, like Tom Brady, I know he won a lot of them, but his teams aren't really known to just be hard hitting. I know they have good defense, but it's always been looked at as that's part of Belichick's scheme and just putting like lower talented guys in positions to make plays. And so he has more depth that way. But I don't know, because it, as the game evolves, that's what you're looking at. And it kind of goes back to our last week's discussion where you add that 17th game, it's not going to be like the postseason. You can take our preseason, you can take away one preseason game, but it's not going to matter much. I mean, you start to get some of the hard-hitting teams into the playoffs. Like, look at the Titans. They come in. They're that kind of ground-and-pound team. They're going to just smash-mouth you. They haven't made a run. So, like, how well does that translate in today's game into the playoffs? And is it kind of like a dying style of football? And, I, mean, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's a dying style, but I think – there has to be balance. And like, when you look at what Tampa did, they were able with Brady to have a ball control style offense. And then when they needed to, when, when they, the coverage backed off, they were able to use Leonard Fournette and they were able to get the yardage on the ground that they needed to win. And I think that's where you're starting to see more of an evolution. Like with more recently for me, I've been going back through some, some games, just to see how some teams were defending things in the nineties when it was, when there was more, um, there was more of a push for like the pro style and you were seeing more ground and pound with like the later years of buddy Ryan's 46. And, and I think one of the things that you started to see is you're not smart. Team teams weren't able just to line up and smash mouth. And I think now that you're seeing defenses go lighter and they're using more, nickel package, dime package. There was a, a, a short video that Nick Saban talked about. Like you can't just line up with your sub personnel anymore because teams will just, they'll, line, they'll change their personnel groupings and they'll get bigger and they'll run it at you. So it, it's not that. It's not as simple as what it used to be. So that, I think from that aspect, it's starting to change of how do you use personnel and how do you use different tight ends of people to – to give yourself an advantage. And it's all, I don't mean it's more of just using that style of offense. I think it's more just the physicality wearing your players down. Like the NFL keeps adding games. Of course, they're going to keep adding games. College football keeps adding games for no reason. And then they're like, oh yeah, we can't do a playoff because, because of the reasons. But then you look and you're wondering, like, how many times does it happen where you get the pure number one and two teams? Like, not that often. I mean, look at basketball this year. You had it, and it worked out that that's who played in the national championship game. Would that have been a difference if they expanded it and added whatever? Because they talked about adding one more round to have, like, almost half the teams into the tournament. To me, that's idiotic. Because at that point, it's like, why are you – playing these 20 game conference schedules in like just cut them like everyone only cares about the tournament so like at the nfl you keep adding these games um why not just expand the playoffs 
people care about the playoffs. These are all professional teams. Guys are getting paid. Do you not want to pay the bonuses? Like people aren't going to care about the 17th week. Like I said, I have a feeling that you add that game. It just makes it a little bit more meaningless. Like look at what NHL and NBA are doing right now. They're trying to balance their schedule and trying to look at how to shorten it. Even Major League Baseball is like, how do we play less games? Because it's not like before where people were going into a game with dollar tickets and there was no television. That's how they made their money back when Major League Baseball started. And that's why it grew to be like the national pastime. Because there were always games you could go to. And even if you had a weird day off, like you didn't have weekends off, uh, like a lot of jobs, you could still go to a game because they still had weekday games or whatever. Now it's like, do you need all these games? Like who watches 162 games? Like as a kid, I remember one one summer with like the Braves were on TV, TBS. I thought, I wonder if I could watch like most of their games. Uh, but of course you don't. Like even as a kid, you're going to go outside and do other stuff and you're not going to be at home every day. And it's like, who, who are all these games for? So uh, the NFL, they start to re- reach that level where your favorite team – is out of the playoffs by week week eight or nine anyway, you're not going to tune in even if there's an extra week. Most fans are going to be casual. They're going to drop off. So that's going to be the main thing. And as I talked about like physicality and wearing it out, maybe it's not even that. Maybe it's the quarterbacks. They can't handle it. Like Ben Roethlisberger. And that's going to be the big thing. Like another week, I feel like we're talking about quarterbacks because that's the most important position And the teams are just going crazy. Like, it can't just be me looking at this and saying, like, what is their mindset? And the big move, of course, Sam Darnold gets traded to the Panthers. We've been talking about him moving. There was no way the Jets were going to draft a guy and then keep Sam Darnold. The crazy thing is they drafted Darnold, I think it was third overall. So they're just going through the same exact cycle. Like, at some point, it's like, all right, If our quarterback's not succeeding, like if you take a guy in the top five, he should at least get you to the playoffs once. Like I I think that like the bottom of that, like if you have to be confident that he's going to get you to the playoffs, if he's not able to do that, I think there are other positions you need to address. Making a quarterback move, if I was a Jets coach or a fan, that's not what I would want to see. I mean, you can keep getting hyped up, but look how many years the Browns finally, like they settled on Baker Mayfield and they're like, this is our guy. Let's try to, you know, build around him for once instead of blowing it up. Because if you remember, there were rumors about maybe the, maybe the Browns should trade him. It's, it's like, why? If you keep getting new quarterbacks, there's never going to be any consistency. Look at all the teams that are consistently in contention. They've had the same quarterback for like 10 years, except for Tom Brady. When he just goes to a new team, you just start thinking that that team's in contention. So, like, it doesn't make any sense to me. And then, of course, this is a, I want to make sure I get this out before I give you a chance to talk. The Panthers come out and say, all right, we might have traded for, for uh, Sam Darnold. We also have Teddy Bridgewater, which basically he's on the move. Because otherwise, you're not going to have three quarterbacks. I, we argued about this last week whenever you were talking about the Steelers making a move for another quarterback. It's like you're not going to have three guys. Now the GM said that he's still open to taking a quarterback with the number eight pick. His quote directly is, we wanted to get a place where the roster was in a good spot so that we could take the best available player at number eight. We could always move up and we could always move back. But this puts us in a position to make the right football decision for this team moving forward. So if one of the top quarterbacks fall to number eight, because right now the top, the top three people on the big board are quarterbacks. There are potentially five quarterbacks that they could take in the top 10. If the Panthers make a move and take a quarterback, how would Sam Darnold even feel? He went to one team where they're like, you're not good enough. We got to draft the quarterback. He's thinking, all right, I'm going to get a new start here with the Panthers. Not even a day. The GM's like, yeah, he's not our guy. We just needed to do something, and uh, we're still going to be there. If the quarterback that we want is there, we're going to take him. Like, great, great franchise, Matt. What do you think? 
I, I, I understand because I'd seen a couple drafts where they were mocking Trey Lance to the Panthers. And we had said if, if they're going with that mobile quarterback type scenario and they're going with Bridgewater as a quarterback and letting Lance learn underneath them, like totally understandable. But I don't I don't know how their the Donald move fits unless you're just completely hedging yourself. And you're just saying, I don't know what my quarterback situation is, but I know I'd rather be on the side with multiple quarterbacks than not enough. Because with what they gave away, uh, a two, a, what was it, a two, six, and seven, I think, or a two, five, and six, I mean, I don't think that that's a lot of, that's, that's a, lo- a large investment for a, for a multi, the quarterback that's been in the league a couple of years. Like when you're looking at they're, they're touting BYU's quarterback as one of the, the hot prospects this year, Darnold's only a year older than him, or like he's only like a little bit like, and he had and he's spent more time in the league. So I mean, to me, when, when you're you're saying about these other quarterbacks, it's like I, I think there there was or the, and there is upside with Darnold, but are you are you giving him the things to succeed? But see, at some point, Darnold is broken. I think it's pretty clear he doesn't have the confidence. So what the GM should have came out and said is, we have a good feeling that Sam Darnold is going to be a starting quarterback in the league for a long time. We want him to come in and battle Bridgewater for our number one quarterback spot, and we're going to address other needs through the draft. Boom. Simple, to the point. You're going to give him confidence. You're going to let Bridgewater know, like, hey, you better bring your A game. And then that's it. Like, very easy to do. Like, I, I would applaud the move if that's the message that I heard them say. I mean, I'm not a Panthers fan. I, I lived down here, so I know a bunch of fans. And it, it's kind of head-scratching to just, just get the mixed messaging. I know you're a professional team. You don't want to do that. But, like, hey, sometimes the fans need to hear, like, an honest analysis to know what direction the team's going. Like, the big one, the Bears – Mixed messaging. Now, like Andy Dalton, you weren't sure on him. Now he's going to be a 33-year-old starter for the Bears that seemingly were a quarterback away. He wasn't even that good of a quarterback for Dallas last year. And so, like, you're like, oh, okay. Now we're going to go ahead and give you a better projection based on your old Cincinnati stats. Oh, yeah, because they're going to get the young Andy Dalton. Like, okay, I'm sure. Like that, that's really going to work out like CBS or I think it's the NFL that I saw one of them, like they did a thing of who's going to go ahead and take that leap. Like, like Andy Dolan's 33 years old. He's not making that jump. Sam Darnold, like you said, very young. Why would you even risk taking that third quarterback? Because now you're going to have two guys battling a, a broken Sam Darnold that possibly could have broken quarterback mentally turn it around. Could Matt Rule come in? And I I was high on Matt Rule coming in. I I think this is going to ruin his touch with the team. Like, I I could be 100% wrong, but, like, when you start to mix up quarterbacks with a young coach, none of the team is going to buy in. They're not going to buy into you. Go ahead. If the the reason that the owner comes out and says, hey, we're we're in the running to drafting a quarterback is because – they understand that for as hyped up as these quarterbacks are, they're going to drive jersey sales. They're going to drive ticket sales. And and I saw the comparison with um, the Cincinnati Bengals that people are saying they need to draft the, the Alabama offensive tackle. And drafting offensive linemen isn't the flashiest or prettiest pick, but – if you don't have your quarterback protected, it doesn't matter who they're throwing to or who's running. They're not going to be successful. So I think the, the right move, if, if he's available, is to try to get protection for your quarterback. Um, but I understand that for, for organizations like Carolina, that if we draft a Trey Lance or we would draft like Justin Fields were to, to tumble out of the top, whatever, and fall to them to draft them, knowing that people are going to be excited about the pick and that they're going to they're going to sell a lot of jerseys for it. 
like there, there is some dollars and cents involved in the moves as well. Well, see, that's why I thought a Sam Darnold move would make sense. Like, why mess with the draft at all and even mess it, message about it? Like, send that messaging out that you're considering it. Like, I get maybe you're playing like a little coy and you want people to come up and t- take that pressure off. I mean, the Falcons are doing the opposite. They've said that they're looking to move the fourth pick if anyone wants to move up. Like, they are I don't think they're looking to make a quarterback move this year. And all right, great. Great for Matt Ryan. They've been close a couple of years ago. Like, why not? But like with the Panthers, they're getting Christian McCaffrey back, who's shown that he could be injury prone. And you don't have that many good years of him left. So why not bring in Sam Darnold and see, like, look, we're giving you these weapons. Um, he played with Robbie Anderson before. I think he's still on contract. And then you have like DJ Moore on the outside. Like that, those are some pretty decent weapons that you have on offense, all you have to do is show some consistency. Come in. We need a veteran guy with some upside. Maybe he can take that jump. McCaffrey gives him enough where he starts to get his confidence and some swagger, and he leads the offense. Like That's what I think they were hoping from Bridgewater. McCaffrey gets hurt. You really don't see that. Like I didn't. I wouldn't see any problem with him saying, like, look, we made the Darnold move. We want to see Bridgewater take that next step, and if he doesn't, Donald's just gonna we're gonna give him a chance to take over or, or whoever wins camp, like whatever. Like get the class competing. That like that's old school type stuff. Where then, like you said, you could focus on bringing in some offensive linemen. Maybe you need some other help on the defense first. Like focus on that. Try to make some moves because I don't think McCaffrey is gonna last m- more than three more years. And so at that point, give him a run. Try to get a guy. Uh, just br- building another young quarterback in. I don't think it's the right move. Um, but in terms of trying to bring in veteran guys, Ryan Fitzpatrick, I think we might've talked about this before goes to the, to the Washington, um, to take over for Haskins and he's age 38. So this is pretty much a team where they looked at it and they said like, we were decent in the playoffs. We had a chance and we had a poor record, but can we get some consistency like, why not go for it? Like, I, I think Carolina could have made that move and said, like, look, we have some young guys on offense. Let's try to bring a spark. If it's not going to be Bridgewater, let it be someone else. But I, I don't know. It could just be me. I was a little disappointed by it. And if they take a quarterback, you're almost starting to get into Brown's territory for me. But I could be tainted on that one. Um <laughs> You got any other thoughts on those before I get into some other quarterback moves? Um, no. I, I'm good with quarterback talk. Yeah, I mean, we got some other ones like that we could hit on. Like I, I saw some people being – they're high on Matt Stafford going out to, to the Rams because I think he has some upside. And then, of course, the easy target would be Goff going to the Lions. The Lions have just been bad. So, of course, you can just say, oh, he's playing for the Lions now. He's going to be awful. It's going to take a quarterback to turn them around. Maybe Stafford wasn't that guy. I don't know if if golf's going to be that guy. Another one, they had uh, Jalen Hurts changing uh, jersey numbers or whatever. And and Eagles fans were – I saw someone comment like, if you have the original number, you knew he was going to be the real deal or something. It's like, okay. Your, your franchise was sending a ton of mixed messages with Wentz. Like, it ha- can't be good for his confidence either. <laughs> like, all right, turn it around. I know Eagles fans, you guys can come at me or whatever, but that's the thing. The, the other team we still haven't heard from, what's the 49ers going to do with Garoppolo? Like, are they going to take that jump? Because at some point with them, it's like, all right, the same type of thing. You have a couple teams being very negative about their quarterbacks. And then the one team that should be negative, the Bears, they're they're going all in. They're like, yeah, hell yeah, we're going to get the old Andy Dalton back. <laughs> People are like, what? Red even, rifle, baby. Even me, I'm like, all right, let's see. Let's see if it pays off. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the Bears will just crash and burn because everyone's looking at that and laughing. Because they're like, why, why are you so confident in this guy? And then, like, Carolina and 49ers are doing, like, the opposite. Like, yeah, we don't have any confidence. We don't know why we even signed this guy. So, 
<laughs> maybe maybe one approach will work. I mean, they could have just did what the Steelers did. Haven't said anything about Haskins. I know everyone's focused on Ben Roethlisberger, but no one's really questioned the signing. Like, he, he's been pretty bad at Washington. How do you think you're going to handle that? Like, nothing. Like, no big deal. Um, so that's pretty much my NFL stuff. Like I said, we we're going to start doing some of the draft, going through the big board. But the more I did it, and I go down through the draft, you have Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Justin Fields, three quarterbacks at the top of everyone's draft board. Then you go down a little bit, you have Trey Lance, and then you have Mac Jones. And you're like, how many quarterbacks are going to be in this draft? You're going to have potentially five guys taken in the, the top 10 at, at quarterback. And I don't think it's going to happen. But then again, crazier things have happened. And some of these teams that are going to take quarterbacks, they're going to have other quarterbacks on the roster. And so maybe, just maybe, it will work out for Pittsburgh. Like if Ben does decide that he's going he's gonna to play one more year and he doesn't get hurt and they make a run or whatever, like the following year, he's eventually going to have to retire. I mean, Drew Brees kept coming to try, trying to come back. But if Roethlisberger again has another fall off and early playoff exit, like I think it's in the cards. Like Maybe it's him. Maybe it's not the team. Maybe, maybe I'm sitting here making excuses about being overworked during the regular season. I don't know. It's off-season talk. But a lot of these teams that are carrying two or three quarterbacks, they're going to have to get rid of them. And maybe Pittsburgh will just be right there saying, we'll take one veteran and we'll, we'll draft a guy and let them battle it out, which is what I think Carolina should have done. That's not, what the, that's not the messaging they're sending. But after the draft, we'll see if they change their tune. If it's kind of like, yeah, we were just posturing. Because like I, I don't see what would be wrong with them coming out and saying that. Like, yeah, we, we knew we had this set. We talked to our guys behind the scenes. And maybe they did talk to them behind the scenes. Because that would be something like if I was a GM, I might say like, hey, we're bringing in publicly. I don't want to show our hand. So I'm going to be making some comments about how we could take a quarterback. But you're our guy. Problem solved. That's the best of both worlds, but I have a feeling that's that's not the case. Even a better situation, just be like Pittsburgh, be like, no, we're not going to do anything. We don't draft you. We don't want you. I know. I keep seeing how the Steelers are known for drafting hidden gems, and there's going to be a ton of guys that fall to them. And I was thinking, yeah, because all these teams are taking a quarterback for no reason. So you're going to have the the highest amount of quarterbacks like taking. In a long time, I mean, maybe the, there was, what was the Mahomes draft where there are a couple good quarterbacks, I forget what year that was. But like, to me, if you get up to where you're getting to like 10 quarterbacks taken and like the first two rounds or whatever, and a lot of them in the first, I just think that you're going to be like, all right, all right, what's going to be the next thing? Because like you still have some of the other ones that are out there. I, I can't remember who I mentioned, but like, there's just a big quarterback list this year and a lot of unknowns too. So it's not like you get Trevor Lawrence. That's the sure thing. What's after that? To me, I would think a lot of projects. You could get a Patrick Mahomes. You could get something totally different. You could get a Sam Darnold that in two years, you're looking around saying this could be better, right? Cause <laughs> that's where the jets are. And so, I'm hoping that the Browns stick with Baker Mayfield, and I really don't want to see them succeed. But maybe that will show a lot of the other teams, like, look, everyone kept saying how we should draft another quarterback, but we didn't. And now we have some consistency, and now we're making the playoffs, and now we're getting some playoff wins, and they can build off that. So um, that's my last thought. Do you have anything else for the NFL? No. I know. I'm going a little bit shorter this week. Uh, the show, I don't know if the show will be long or not. Um, I had some stuff for college stuff that I wanted to hit on. Uh, the basketball national championships. I, sh- I should have been higher on Baylor. They win the national championship. I was kind of not sold on them because you never know. They had an older roster. I can't remember what the average is, but they had one of the older teams in the NCAA tournaments. And sometimes that kind of overinflates the regular season. But, man, did they come out on fire. 
and Gonzaga couldn't match up. And that's why I look at the Gonzaga team, and I know I picked them, and I said they, they could go wire to wire undefeated. And they definitely could. Like, I'm not saying that they were overmatched and that they wouldn't win that game. I mean, they could play them 10 times, and it could be it could have been a 5-5 five and five split. Um, because Baylor just wasn't missing any shots. And normally, you don't come out and shoot like 60% from three. Like, you just don't. I mean, they weren't uncontested looks. They were taking shots from out near midcourt at one point with the hand in the face and hitting it. Like, it's just your night. Michigan played a national championship game like that against Villanova where they were hitting everything. And so, hats off to them. Gonzaga got to come back. And that's the second national championship they lost. They're in the same position as Michigan. Can they keep taking advantage of these deep runs and bringing in better recruiting classes? Because I think they can. And I don't see any reason to panic. That was Baylor's first national championship in basketball. And, and Scott Drew stayed there forever. I know well, we talked about football coaches. What did you say? I think it's their first national championship in anything. Are you disrespecting Brittany Griner like that, Matt? <laughs> I guess I am. <laughs> How dare you? That's my favorite women's basketball player of all time. Never be beaten in my book. A lot of trash talking, and she backed it up. Um, I think th I don't know if they have other ones, uh, but that that's one where you look at the school, and like I said, it could have went either way. I think that was the best matchup, and it's very rare that you have two teams that are number one and two all year, and they go wire to wire, make it to the national championship game, and then play. It, it wasn't really a classic game just because of the score and how Baylor just kept, I mean, they wouldn't miss their shots. So as, as you write that out, um, you're just like, okay, that was one for the record books. Uh, I, I did think that UCLA played well. Michigan lost to them. I thought Michigan could have, I mean, they definitely could have made the Final Four. But they're missing the same thing that Baylor had, um, guys that could just make baskets that are contested. Like that's been Michigan's thing down the stretch. I don't know if Isaiah Livers could have made that difference because you kept hearing the announcers talking about like he's a big out for Michigan. They're not going to have that guy that's able to take over. Wagner came in. They gave him two great shots. He missed them both. I think one was an air ball. And it's like, all right, there's rumors that he's going to go to the NBA, which I'm going to get to in a second here with like the extra year of eligibility stuff. Uh, but I just want to give a shout out to, to Baylor um, just because they went through. There's a lot of, like I, I guess, negative, not really uh, stuff just about them being a small school, not having the guys. Uh, they've had some issues. I don't even know if it's in recent years, but they kind of fought through all that and came back. I mean, even their football program has been relevant, more relevant than the other teams in Texas. And um, so I don't forget there are also some crazy coaching moves. Chris Beard leaves Texas Tech to go to Texas. He just had Texas Tech in the national championship game. They could have been Baylor. They could have won this national championship, and then he would have went to their rival. That, that would have been like Matt, Tom Izzo in 2000, taking Michigan State to the national championship. They ended up winning it, so it's a little bit different. But then him just saying, like, peace out, I'm going to go to, to coach Michigan. <laughs> like, it's unbelievable. And I don't know, you know, if you watch basketball, but do you have any thoughts on that? Like, how could one coach go from a rival, the same conference, so it's not really a, a step up, to just coach, like, after the success he's had? Like, what would your mindset be? Well, I think it's one of two things. I think when you look at it like that, it could be a situation where you're trying to to tell the university, like, I need, you know, whether it be facilities, these are what my needs are for us to be competitive. And the university is just like, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. We're not going to help you. And you have your competitor that's like, we want you here and we're going to give you all the resources that you need to be successful. Um, I think that that makes it easier. And the bottom line to a lot of these moves is, are you going to pay the most money? 
So if you end up getting a pay raise or you end up getting some kind of benefit out of it that professionally helps you out, then why not go to a bigger program? Well, see, I was going to say that it could have been about the money. Texas could have got out the money cannon and just went nuts. Like you can't, you can't convince me that if Michigan wanted Tom Mizzo, they, and maybe they did throw him an offer sometime. Like that's just me throwing that out there, like as a crazy speculation, just to try to put this in perspective. Because it's not so much like Pitt and Penn State fans. They're, like they're not. It's not an equivalent. They've never been in the same conference. Like to have that type of rivalry. But like that's basically if Michigan wanted to pay more than Michigan State, they would, and they could. I mean, it's pretty clear. They pay more for coaches. Texas is in the same boat. But they didn't really throw the extra money at him. So is it recruiting? Because they had Shaka Smart. And I think a lot of Texas recruiting classes, they came in because of his name recognition. So I don't know if it was so much about like Texas basketball. Because to me, when I hear basketball, like I don't think Texas Longhorns. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I don't even know... Um, well, let's try to look it up real quick because uh, I did look up the Baylor championships. That's actually their fifth. They had one in tennis in 2004. Then they had the three women's basketball ones and then one in basketball, which was this year. Um, but like there's no like like Virginia Tech has never won a national championship in anything. They had a good run. Uh, a while ago in basketball. And so I wonder if some of these schools, like they have the football money at some point when you're not winning in football, do you just go ahead and make that transition to basketball? I don't know. Easier to have the numbers. I'm not trying to discredit anything Baylor's done. They've had a good run. They were close to making the playoffs in football whenever the Big 12 came out with their one champion. And then they didn't name one champion. And so they got... Both teams left out. Remember that? <laughs> classic. Yes. Classic Big 12. That's another reason why I wasn't high on the Big 12 and the Big 10 because I feel like they put so much marketing into this is a tough conference and then they haven't really shown anything. I mean, that was the Big 12's second championship this uh, millennium. The other one was Kansas 2008. Big 10 has won. Two of you count Maryland being in the conference now even though that was an ACC one. And Michigan's was at the turn of the century in 2000, if you even count that as a starting year instead of 2001. So you get some teams in there, but eventually they have to win it. Um, but looking it up, I did know, so they did say that there was two teams from Texas that won the national championship. The other one is Texas Western. They never really said it on the show, so or not on the show. During the game, so I'm like, why don't they say who the other champion was? But it was Texas Western in 1966. So Texas hasn't won a national championship. Um, has have they even been in one? Let's let's go through this list and see if it shows me. Because you have Texas Tech definitely was in one a couple years ago, and I don't think they were. So unless my search is wrong, like Texas, the Longhorns have never even been in a national championship game. So. Chris Beard's taking a move that it just doesn't make sense. You're not going to grab the money. You're going to try to go there because you want to be hated. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I don't get it. It could be crazy. Uh, maybe I'm missing something, but as I, I, I just an outsider, I'm looking at it and I'm saying like, all right, maybe uh, I did look up Texas. Cause I guess that would have been the easier thing at the start. They do claim one pre-tournament championship from 1933. They've only been to three Final Fours. One of them, was that Kevin Durant or is that too early, 2003? Um, so not that much success. Never been a runner-up. So Texas Tech, potentially the better program. He jumped to them. We'll see how it goes. The other big one, uh, Roy Williams stepped down on April 1st which to me would have been the funniest April Fool's joke if he announced he was coming <laughs> back. And I thought everyone kept saying like, no, it's real. It's real. They're tweeting about it. And I'm like, just be fake. Like just be a fake April Fool's. That would have been hilarious. But I get it. Like how old are you? Uh, a lot of these older coaches have been underachieving. 
But they named Hubert Davis an old basketball player. He's been an assistant with Roy Williams for however long um, as their as their next coach. To me, I feel like this is a product of Juwan Howard. If Juwan Howard wouldn't have had that that success at Michigan these past two years, I feel like this hire never would have happened. Because you're giving a coach that has no head coach experience, a ton of assistant experience, a good rapport with the players. Uh, I guess you have some of his recruiting background. Juwan Howard had like none in terms of recruiting because he's been in the N- NBA for uh, 30 years, it feels like. Um, he just kind of stopped playing one day and just became the player coach on the bench. And then the Heat just kept him there. <laughs> like, <laughs> just played for 50 years. And like, oh, you're still here. Yeah, that'd be like your, your job's like they announce that they're downsizing, but you just ignore it and just keep coming in. And you're just there. And then eventually they're like, hey, we need a new manager. It's like, yeah, I'm here. I'll keep coming in. Like That's all I feel like Juwan Howard was doing. I, I'm not to discredit him because he's been a great coach. And even just some of his big man stuff, you can tell he made an immediate impact. But let's see what Uber Davis is able to do. Because they had Wes Miller at Greensboro, which is another um, Tar Heel legacy. And I thought that that was going to be the move. A lot of people down here said that he was too young yet. So they're wondering if this move is kind of a, let's see what happens. Maybe he can keep the recruiting class and everything going. Um, it wasn't that late of an announcement. So it's not like when Beeline left Michigan, the thing that annoyed me is he waited until like right around the NBA draft and player signing day was done. And so like players were going to ask out of their commitments some of them went right to the NBA, so he screwed the recruiting class. And then Michigan really couldn't find another coach in the middle of the summer. Um, so their hands were tied. Like UNC, they wasted no time. So I wondered if they had already had that plan in. And, and you've seen that success with Florida State having a coach in waiting. What do you think of their move? Well, um, I think when you kind of know – that, that you're going to be in that transition and you have an opportunity to vet the next person coming in, I think it can be successful. I just think it's, it's a slippery slope because when you have a lot of schools that are, are saying you need to interview and, and put in the time with X number of minority coaches and, and different things, I think you just have to be careful with naming that, um, that person really quick without going through the, through all the appropriate hoops. Well, that's going to be something that um, I like. I don't even know because whenever you're hiring within, and he already checked that bo- checks that box anyway. So, like, yeah. say, let's just get that out um, out there, and let's just hire him. Maybe that that skips a step because if you're hiring within, like when Florida State did. Jimbo Fisher, did they have to hire outside? I don't know what the rules are in college. Well, Jimbo was the last one of the we're naming our, our next head coach before like you have to go through that. The the process has changed since then. Oh, okay. That's what I wasn't sure. I couldn't remember. I know it's been a few years. Yeah, no, it was after Jimbo went through, it's almost like they changed it because of Florida State. They're like Oh, they were able to name another coach and were successful in a national championship. We can't have can't have Florida State winning like that. See, for for UNC, I would think that if they wanted to try to get a successful coach, they could. Because the big thing is gonna be I don't think Coach K is gonna last that much longer. Um not for like health reasons or whatever. It seems like he always skips a game or two these days because of health reasons. But, like, what's going to be their contingency plan? I mean, he's already 74 years old. So, like, I almost wonder if UNC is just trying to get a jump on it and kind of like a wait-and-see game. Because I'm still thinking, like, you look at Baylor, they have success, they're a private school. who's Who's their driving force? Their head coach. Look at Villanova, a private school. Who's their, who's their driving force? Head coach Jay Wright. You look at Gonzaga, who's their driving force? Their head coach, Mark Few. These guys have been at their school 
for decades. So like for these small private schools, this is only the third time I think they said that two private schools even met in the national championship. So like Duke fits that bill and they're like coach K is there outside of their basketball program. And I mean, they know they offer like the high academics and things like that. I think UNC has a more of a long-term success path. I think right now coach K is the reason why some of these kids are going there. When he's gone, what happens to that? Like UNC, they might, they're trying to build their legacy. They're naming former players, like showing you like, hey, we have guys that can come in. I mean, it's pretty clear that that's what Michigan did too, and it's paid off on the recruiting path. Um, UCLA went a different way. They hired uh, the, the coach from Cincinnati, uh, so not really ties to the program that I know of. I mean, I could be wrong there, uh, but whenever you're bringing in a guy, like UNC, I would think that they would have their pick. That's one of the top programs in all of college basketball. And so they went a different route. Last time they they hired Roy Williams, like right from Kansas. Like yeah. that's one blue blood to another. Like that's almost unheard of. That's like Notre Dame just hiring Nick Saban. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, no, we see what you're doing over there, sir. We do not like it. You got to come and work for us for a bit. Like that's like the the, the level that they're on. And I mean, like, I know UNC had some more success compared to Notre Dame recently. So I don't want to knock them, but I think that's the big thing. So you have the championships coming through. Can these guys get it back? I think some of the consistency is there. Will North Carolina make that jump? A lot of the blue blood programs didn't show it. Um, I did want to mention the women's game. I watched it. Arizona made the championship and they played Stanford. So you had another Pac-12 team where both tournaments full of West Coast teams. And um, I did want to bring up, too, uh, but let's talk about the women's basketball tournament first. So Arizona had a chance to win the game. And they did the same thing that Michigan did, where I don't like when you run the clock out. And I know that you have your guy that you think, like, this is going to be the person that takes the shot. Like, Arizona gave the ball to their star player. Uh, Stanford just like triple teamed her. Like they had no other plan. So she ended up just jacking a three from way behind the line, hit the rim, could have bounced in, but of course she missed it. But I almost wonder, like you have to know as a coach that they're going to go after your best, your best person. Like why not go to the hoop, try to play for the tie? Cause I'm pretty sure the three would have won. Same with the Miss Michigan situation. Like I know you're going to give the ball to Wagner. You know that's your NBA guy. Let's see what's happening. Livers is out. I would have liked to see Michigan give the shot to Brown or Brooks, two of their better three-point shooters. Because if you're going to give it to Wagner, at least have him make a move towards the hoop and go for the tie and play for overtime. And Arizona was in the same position where I thought, all right, you're giving your point guard the ball. There was like five or six seconds. Made two or three dribbles, and then they had to just like jack it up. You had plenty of time to make that extra pass. Why not try to do a screen at the top or anything to try to get a play? It's like as a coach, I would feel like you would have to regret that. But you got to tip your cap to Stanford. I thought Stanford won it a few years ago, but apparently they haven't won it since like 1992, which is just mind-boggling. Um, but anything, did you watch a women's one? I didn't even watch the men's one because when you start at almost 10 o'clock, if it's not if it's not football related, I'm probably not watching. Well, that was going to be my next thing because I complained about it last week, and I said, and so I said either way, I had a feeling that the elite eight ratings were going to tank, and then even like the final four, I want to see if they came in because I they didn't have them when I sent this the other day. Um, so they put Michigan and UCLA on at the last game. It came in, and just awful. They said that the Michigan game was down 57% from the 2019 slot. Of course, it used to be on the weekend. So, of course, there was going to be a decline. But like you said, they're putting these games on so late, it didn't even matter. I turned on the championship game at 9. It was such a blowout. I don't know when I fell asleep. But I, 
it wasn't interesting. I, I definitely couldn't stay awake. And I'm like, I'm not going to force myself to watch the rest of this game just for the show. And I didn't really miss anything. Gonzaga, B Baylor was on fire the entire time. They just kept shooting well. And then that was it. But I just wonder, like, with UCLA getting so many late matchups, did it favor them? Because they, they're, they're coming to the East Coast. So 10 o'clock, they're playing the games for them would be like a 7 o'clock tip-off. Like those East Coast teams, Alabama shot very poorly. The time zone couldn't mess with them. They're playing super late. Michigan looked like they were dead at the end of the game. I mean, even whenever LSU played in that same time slot against Michigan, it's like, why are all these teams playing so late? It's clearly affecting something. And then the West Coast teams, they're coming across. It's easier for them. Like it, that's just facts. Like you can look it up. Even the NFL tries to do some things to get around it with their scheduling just because the time zone for them, a seven, like the game's ending at 9 PM of their regular time. Like they don't just magically adjust to the Eastern time zone in one day or even like a week. So like, to me, I wonder why I know they were given Gonzaga the precedent for like that early you're the number one seed. Let's give you the seven o'clock game, but it didn't matter. Houston or Gonzaga and USC that first game. And Houston and Oregon State were the least watched Elite Eight games of all time. People just didn't care. USC wasn't that highly rated coming in. They're not known for basketball. Like I've said, Gonzaga is a small private school. If you're trying to help yourself, you put on your two big boy programs, UCLA and Michigan. You make that your primetime game. I don't care who the overall number one seed is. I don't care that Gonzaga is undefeated. Casual fans do not care about that. They just don't. I mean, we've seen it in football where you can have an 8-4 Michigan team playing an Ohio State team, and that's going to kill everything else in the ratings. Like, it just doesn't matter. Michigan could have the worst losing record. The spread could be 20, negative 20. Ohio State's going to kill them. It still gets the best ratings. Like, <laughs> So why would you put on the small schools? It doesn't matter if, like, Northwestern would be undefeated playing – like some other school, like it just doesn't matter. They're not going to get the same exact rating. So um, I, don't, I don't really see the final four ones were down again in 2021. And that's a perfect comparison. All sports were down. They took a dip. Let's see what the things were. They only averaged 11 vi million viewers, 11.8, which is down from 14%. Uh, the Gonzaga and UCLA game did bring in more, um, almost 15 million viewers. But of course, Baylor, Houston, two Texas teams, both smaller schools. I mean, Houston's in a big city, but they haven't been relevant since the 80s. And Baylor killed them. So everything's down. I, I wouldn't be surprised if the national championship game was down just because it was a blowout. But at some point, when you're telling players you can't pay them and you're making dumb business decisions, it has to hurt all around. So... I'm hoping they were supposed to do meet with some of the players um, like from Michigan and talk about getting paid for next year because like there were rumors that Isaiah Livers might come back, but he wanted to meet to see if he could make money. And I don't blame him because if you, you get injured, your, your only option right now is to come back to college. Michigan has a big time recruiting class coming in. You're going to be down minutes. Like it's just going to have to happen. You're a senior. Um, like there's not going to be enough minutes to go around. So you can either get paid by jumping to the NBA. You might not be drafted now because you were injured. We don't know. And, but there's no other way for him to make money. He can't stay at Michigan and try to boost his draft status, Matt. He's done. So I hope they change something, but I, they're not going to change it by next year. So, uh, uh, I don't even know. I just feel bad for the guy. Your team's right there. You get nothing. Um, and that's my last topic, the extra year of eligibility. Uh, because I don't know how some schools are going to balance this. Uh, I have the actual NCAA ruling right here. So what they said, um, it says, like, traditionally, an athlete can play four years of their sport within five years with one red shirt or whatever. Now they're giving every team an extra year. 
that means the NCAA student athletes can compete in all or a portion of this season, the 2020 and 2021 season, but it won't be counted against their years of eligibility. So those guys that normally like Isaiah Livers, he'd be out, can't come back. He can now. So he's eligible for one extra year. But everyone thought that they might boost the scholarships or whatever. This is what they announced. For college coaches, the extra year of eligibility means that roster needs may be different for the 2021-22 season. If your senior class decides to return, coaches will need to fill fewer spots and possibly reevaluate positions they are recruiting. Ooh, what a slap in the face. So like you, because I would assume, right, Matt, that if, if the senior's coming back, that's kind of like a free scholarship because of the coronavirus. What this says is the opposite. Like if you're Florida State and you're like, all right, we had a tough year. We have all these seniors. Now your coach and you bring a big time recruiting class in, you're like, we're going to use this recruiting class to kind of boost us up. Now you have to decide, am I going to cut seniors or am I just not going to sign the class that I thought I was going to sign? And it affects football because it, is, it affects all 2021 fall sports and winter. There's no change for the spring because last year's spring or whatever, I don't know, they didn't give them an extra eligibility. I guess no, it was from last year because it got canceled. So they didn't play. I'm not sure. Um, so I guess everyone could just come back for this year. And so they're already kind of ahead. But football teams going into this fall and winter teams, which football, they've already signed their class. So how many players are going to hit that transfer portal? And as a coach, how would you even handle it? I think you just look at it like, there. do you pick – which guys do you feel like you need to hit? So if you know that, like, your offensive line's an issue, if you can go to the portal and grab a guy, you know, that that may be the route that you go to try to win now. Just be like, we're going to just push push everything in trying to bring in this, this player or two. Um, but uh, I'm sure that the transfer portal is going to be full. And, and who it ends up hurting in the long run are – the seniors of this class and the the kids that really didn't have a lot of opportunities to earn a scholarship because of their states choosing not to allow athletes to, to play because of coronavirus. And they're still going to get a spot because I, that's what I'm wondering. So my, my big look is for the, like the transfer portal. So I was trying to look for the actual number. The NCAA says that since it's been in debut, they've had like 15,000 students enter their name, which is a ton. Like I already thought, and I don't know if this is just for basketball, but I thought that they said for basketball right now, there are 900 names in the transfer portal. And that's probably all divisions, but that's like ridiculous. So for football, that's if awesome. that... If that's how many are in for, for basketball, there has to be thousands for football. And so if you're looking at that, I think that's where you're going to start to see teams just like – because of football right now, their seniors are back. Everyone's battling. You can have freshmen in for workouts if they enrolled early. You, As a coach, you know like this guy's not going to be able to make it. And I think you're just going to start to see names enter that portal. I'm pretty sure just like – Watching, watching Michigan spring football news that they've already had three or four people enter in the transfer portal that are in team workouts right now. And you know it's because they have guys either announcing that they're coming back or that some of their other like enrollees or whatever are working out and they're seeing like, I'm not playing anymore. So I'm going to go ahead and, and start the transfer. And with basketball, you would have to think that that's going to be a complete mess because like, Michigan right now, they have the number one class. Florida State's number two. Both teams went far in the tournament. If you have seniors announce that they're going to come back and try to make that run, what do you tell your recruiting class? 
Like Florida State has four commits. If the seniors decide to come back, do they cut them? Do they cut other people? Like it's good to have choice, but at some point, like how are you, how are you not lying to the teammates or whatever? Like I feel like that's going to fracture a lot of teams. I mean, Alabama's in the same situation. Coming off a deep basketball run, they have four commits right now. If the coach, if that team, like they, the seniors come and band together, and um, I've heard that the NC, NC State women's team has said that their seniors are going to do the same thing. They, they came in, they beat a couple of number one teams, they were a number one seed, came out of the tournament like in, in the Elite Eight or Sweet 16. So they underachieved in the tournament. They've made the decision to all come back. Awesome. Let's go for another run, try to get a national championship. But what does that mean for your team's roster next year? And then are you going to have like a blip year where this recruiting class in three or four years, that, that's going to be your juniors or seniors, that doesn't exist. So are you prepared to crash that year? And How many programs are going to have a down year? in whatever year that ends up being, 2025 or 2024. It's going to be – like I don't think the people at NCA, they're, they're not thinking through these scenarios. They just made the thing and they're like, all right, keep it the same, I guess. Like I would love them to just start live streaming their meetings. Like why not? I would, I would listen to that. It's better than podcasts. I mean we're doing one right now. What's the difference? Listen to our show and then listen to the NCA stream to see what they're actually talking about. Maybe they'll pay some players. But that, that's my thing. I wanted to bring it up. It, just get off my chest because I feel bad for these players. They're not going to get the money from the NCA. They're going to be stuck. You're going to sign for a team, and you're going to be told, hey, we don't have a spot for you anymore. Now you're, the transfer portal is going to be full. All these teams are cutting players. Where are they going to go? Where are they going to go? And for football, are you going to see, like you said, with all these younger teams that from states that like whatever didn't have spring or fall football or spring football? Let's say all the all the D one schools, like whatever they call themselves, the bold subdivision. What if they're all full? They all end up having to go to the lower division. How many upsets are we going to see? from teams like that just because they're pulling better recruits than they're used to. A handful? None? That's that's my final thought. You have any thoughts on it? Well, I think the kids, you know, the more that I think about it, the kids that really end up getting affected, it's not your seniors because I think there will be a level of like if they were if they were players that were seeing significant playing time, they're obviously going to get the extra benefit. I think your freshmen are going to get the benefit. The kids that are going to be, that are really going to get pushed out and processed through are going to be those freshmen and sophomores that they, they weren't pushing for a significant playing time that they may just say, Hey, it, we got these seniors. We, we got to stay. We got to help develop our younger guys. You need to look elsewhere. And that's, those are going to be the guys that are going to be hurt. Like the, the guys that take a little bit longer to develop and maybe won't see playing time till late their junior year, senior year. Those are going to be the kids that, that are going to be affected in all this. And I think you're going to see other like things that they didn't even think through. Like uh, I know basketball is more on my mind because they just had a tournament, but Indiana went through their coaching change and already some of their top players are saying that they're going to transfer now because they're bringing in a new coach. You don't know how long that transition is going to take. Didn't make uh, a lot of like progress this year towards your goal of winning a national championship. I don't remember if they made the tournament or not. So it's better just to say, hey, where can I go that's close? Like you're looking at some of these teams like Florida State, Alabama, they're, they've been very close. Can we just transfer there? Uh, let's see where else. Like outside, I mean, even in the division or whatever. Like, why wouldn't you try to transfer to, like, a Villanova or even a Gonzaga after watching that game? Say, hey, I'm a scorer. They look like they could need some scorers on that team. Why can't I just transfer there right now? How many of their guys are coming back? Let's do it. Let's finish the undefeated season next year. Like, I just don't see 
how the NCAA is going to balance that whenever they're like, all right. Plus, like you have the, the Blue Bloods, like Duke, they're doing the opposite. They're just trying to sign their freshman class. They're not going to compete. I mean, you've already seen Duke and Kentucky bring in these freshman classes, and it takes like all year for them to gel and start to play together. If teams are bringing back seniors, Duke's freshmen are not going to be able to beat like teams made up of 23 and 24 year old guys. <laughs> like they're 18 years old. It's not going to happen. <laughs> so, like, don't be surprised if you see a lot of these blue bloods again bounce in the tournament. And it has to scare them. It has to scare them whenever they see teams like Michigan, Florida State, and Alabama go deep in the tournament. They have the heavy pockets from football money. Also, bring in top recruiting classes. Like, it has to scare the crap out of them. Like, I, I just don't see how, if you're a fan of any of those schools and, and you see, like, old coaches retiring and you're like, this is fine. Like, I'm sure it will be fine, right? Like, right? Because, <laughs> like, uh, I mean, how many of those other schools never, ever bounce back? And whenever the, the football money keeps coming, because let's be honest, that football money isn't stopping. It's not stopping. So what teams are frivolously going to spend on, like you said, facilities and other things? Like if Texas is going to pluck a, a coach from like Texas Tech, why wouldn't they just pluck Scott Drew from Baylor next? Like what if Oklahoma says, you know what? Why don't you come coach us? Like we, we're taking a national championship. Like why not? Like come right in. And so that's where I, I think you see some of these other ones. Like there's only a handful of blue blood schools that are going to be able to pull those coaches in. And if they don't even try, look out. Because the sport is ripe for teams that can get hot and just shoot around and have a bunch of like Baylor where you're just going to make that first national championship. You start to build a program like they did with their women's. They got up to three national championships. What if they do the same thing in basketball? It's much easier to build a basketball program than it is a football program, especially because football still, you know which four teams are making the playoffs or at least three of them. So it's a little bit slighted in that, that way right now. Just expand it all. That's my final thought. Uh, you have anything for the final bell? I do actually. I Florida state hired a new senior defensive and that analyst. They plucked old Randy Shannon who spent last year at UCF as the defensive coordinator, the longtime Hurricane coach and player. Uh, glad to see someone with, with some of those connections down in Florida coming to the right side for a change, coming to the Knolls, and I, th I think he's going to be someone to really help out um, with evaluating players and just, just different stuff within the program. So I like that. Hypo didn't want to take him to Tennessee with him. That's okay. We'll take him. Is that a big move, though? He wasn't really successful as a coach. But I think in terms of recruiting, yes. And I think that's where Florida State's really needed to pick it up. And if he has those connections with the high school coaches in Florida and can pull them in, then it's 100% a help. If they want, just want guys that can recruit, Matt, you know who else is out there? Brady Hoke. Well, we're not looking for five star hearts. We've got enough of those over the years. We need to we need to get back to winning. Hey, you saw what his recruits could do. Harbaugh almost uh, won the Big Ten that one year with his guys. Then he got like eleven people drafted in the NFL. Brady Hoke signed some top five classes, or at least top ten. I don't remember if that they might only had one in the top five, but that dude could recruit. Maybe more Midwest though, but sometimes you need those guys. Bring in Shannon and then bring in Brady Hoke, and then that you got two killer recruiters right there. That's what you I would try to do. Mom, to do. Um, I don't think I have anything else. I try to look around. Uh, so that's pretty much it. A lot of NCAA stuff this week, just because basketball tournament, and then basically NCAA stuff's going to be over. I know there's some spring, spring football games and things like that, but the big thing is going to be the roster moves. Uh, it affects both basketball and football. It's easier to explain in basketball, so I went heavy in basketball this week. But we got some NFL draft stuff. Like I said, we put it off because of the quarterback moves. 
who knows? Maybe next week Garoppolo will move. Maybe the Panthers make another quarterback move or something. Maybe the Steelers do too. And we'll be talking about quarterbacks again, but that's the show. Football stuff, so uh, we'll be hitting on it if it happens. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.